Our scripture passage today is from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 6, verses 39 to 42. Before we read this, let us pause for a moment in prayer. Good and gracious Father, who is the giver of all good gifts, you have also, Lord, given us your holy word to direct us and to guide us and to teach us. Lord, these words inspired by your Holy Spirit... Lord, we know if we were to understand them, we must be once again inspired by that same Spirit. So, Lord, I pray that Spirit move among us now, Lord, into our hearts, into our minds, into our understanding, that we may hear, that we may read, that we may know your will for us. Lord, bless this holy reading of your holy word, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is the gospel according to Luke, chapter 6, verses 39 to 42. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Jesus also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck that is in, take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever been in a situation where you were looking for a word? You were looking for a word to describe a situation or a person or or, or something you were involved in, but you didn't know what the word was. And then so you went hunting along for this word, knowing that there's got to be a word for this out here. There's got to be a word that describes this, that will just just say exactly what I want to say. So you go hunting for the word, only to find out that the word doesn't exist. Like nobody has yet come up for a word to describe this situation that I am looking for. Well, I found myself in a situation like that this week, as I was studying and, and, and reading about this passage, there was a word I was looking for, and I couldn't find it. And I looked through the dictionary, looked through the sari, I googled it, I scoured the internet, I looked at these little, uh, they, they got these websites where people ask questions, is there, is there, what's the word that means this? And everyone will give an answer, and no one, no one had an answer. And what I was trying to describe is a person that likes to pick out the faults of other people. A person that loves to go in other people's lives and to find their faults and to pick them out and expose them. And there were a few decent candidates. You know, Pharisee was the first one that came to mind. Pharisee does that. And Pharisees do that, but a Pharisee is known more for his self-righteousness and for wanting to to seem righteous in in the face of others, which people who pick out the faults of others do that, but that seemed to be the focus on the Pharisee. Then I thought... You no know, nitpicker. That was a good one. Somebody who nitpicks is always picking at the faults of others. But then I thought, you know, a nitpicker, they do, they're just kind of detail-oriented with everything, not just other people's faults. And then I'm like, well, busybody. That kinda, that's kind of close. But a busybody's in somebody's business no matter what, good or bad, picking out faults or picking out something else. So I finally decided I had to make up the word myself. So I made up a word this week. I don't know if it's going to take off. You might feel like it's awful, but I made up a word to describe a person who likes to pick out the faults of others. And I call him a dokonite. Now, there's a good reason for that. Okay, dokon is the Greek word for log. 
as in, why are you picking out the speck in your brother's eye when you have a log or a dokon in your own eye? So you're a dokonite. Well, maybe. And then, then I try, okay, there's some other options. You don't have to use dokonite. A thought may be a moat picker. You know, as in the, in the King James talked about the speck in your brother's eye, they called it a moat. And a moat is a single piece of dust. That's one, one piece of dust is a moat, duster and moats. And so a moat is, you have one piece of dust in your eye, and a moat picker is going to find that one piece of dust in your eye and point it out to other people. So a moat picker. Dokonite, moat picker. Or if you don't like any of those, maybe speckler. As in someone who looks at the speck in other people's eyes instead of a heckler, you're a speckler. Yeah? Maybe. Try it out. Just try it out this week. See which one works. Dokonite, moat picker, speckler, any one of those. The lesson, though, is the same, whatever you call it. Don't do it. And it's a lesson, I think, that we need to hear, a lesson we really need to hear about picking out the faults of others. And when I say we, I don't mean necessarily us here at the church. We generally do pretty good with that. We're not perfect on it. But I'm talking about we as a society, we as a world. I don't know what's happened last 20, 30 years or so. We've gotten really, really enthusiastic about picking out the faults of other people. We've, some have gotten obsessed about it, of picking out the faults of other people, of plastering them across the Internet. And the worst part is we reward them for doing it. Or at least they feel rewarded. They feel like they've, they've corrected some injustice. They've done their good job in pointing out and laying out the faults of other people. Some even think it's their job. That, that, that's their job. I'm going to scour the internet. I'm going to look at people's Instagram pages and their Facebook profile and dig through old emails and old Twitter postings and try to find something that people have done wrong that we can disagree with it so we can post it and shame them publicly. I'll give you a, a case in point. A few years ago, a, uh, this girl was going to her prom and she posted a picture of herself in a prom dress on an Instagram account like, well, Every teenage girl in America does. But the dress that she had picked out is called a, a chioxum. I, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. A chongsum or something like that. Some people call it a, a Shanghai dress. And you, you'll know what I'm talking about if you saw it. It's kind of a traditional Chinese dress. It's the form-fitting one with the short sleeves, a little bit shorter skirt. It was real popular in China or in Shanghai around the, like the 1920s and 30s. Now, the girl, when she posted this, there was this, this huge uproar about her wearing this dress to the prom and posting it on Instagram because she was white. And every, people were getting all upset with her. Oh, you're appropriating Chinese culture. How You know, you're, you're advancing a colonial agenda. How dare you do this and wear this Chinese dress? And I mean, the girl just thought the dress was cute. She just liked the dress. Like, there was no malice involved. She wasn't trying to appropriate or take somebody's culture. She wasn't trying to advance a colonial agenda. She just thought she looked nice in a dress. And she was wanting to post it. But there were other people, ironically, who were also white people, that believed it was their job to expose this perceived wrong and display it for the whole world to see. They were being moat pickers or dokenites or specklers. But whatever you call it, it is an extremely unchristian thing to do. But you got to admit, Christians were notorious moat pickers. We have got a long and storied reputation for picking the moats out of other people's eyes and ignoring the log in our own. But Christians are not the only moat pickers. Far, far from it. We are not the only moat pickers. See, anybody can be a moat picker. Anybody can be a moat picker. It's when a person has decided that they know the difference now between good and evil, between right and wrong, between injustice and justice, and they have decided 
to try to live their life and promote what is good and right and just. And, and as soon as you decide to do that, as soon as you decide to live your life right and promote what is right and good, you're going to notice other people not doing right and good. And you're going to see wrong and injustice everywhere you look. It's in the TVs, it's in our shows, it's in our culture, it's in our laws, and other people are, are, are doing wrong. And you see it all over the place. And so you're like, I'm trying to do good. I'm trying to do right. And, and, and you're messing it up. You're doing wrong. And so you start to pick out the wrongs of others. You feel compelled to point it out. You see, anybody who believes themselves to be in a morally superior position can be a moat picker. It doesn't matter, left or right, liberal or conservative, you can be a moat picker too. From the moral majority, which did a lot of moat picking, to your environmental warriors, which do a lot of moat picking, to those who advocate strongly against alcohol, to those who are members of the woke revolution. And those seem to be the most notorious today, those who call themselves part of the, the woke mob or woke revolution. They've made people forget at least temporarily, that Christians are terrible moat pickers. They've taken the limelight in that, and we can thank them. But honestly, whatever makes you feel superior, in any case, whatever makes you feel superior can make you feel entitled to point out the flaws of other people. But the real reason we do it, the real reason we, we moat pick is, well, it's an act of self-inflation. And it really is an easy way to make you feel good about yourself. You know, it's like, it's like getting a sugar high. You feel good just for a minute, but then you're going to crash. Not long after that, you're going to feel even worse. But it's an instant boost to the self-esteem. I mean, it really is. If you're feeling inadequate, if you're feeling low, best way to feel good about yourself, put somebody else down. Feel better instantly. Of course, you'll feel worse later. But for a minute, for a minute, you'll feel good. Picking moats, acting like a dokenite, being a speckler. Helps the old self-esteem every time. With a price. It always comes with a price. See, Jesus had some choice words for people who want to do this. He posed a question to his disciples. He says, can the blind lead the blind? If you're a blind person, can you lead another person who is also blind? It's his way of saying, if you're not righteous, if you're not already righteous, how is it that you can possibly presume to teach and lead somebody else in their righteousness? Because if you're not, it'll be like a blind man leading a blind man, and both of you will fall into a pit. And then Jesus follows it up with this wonderful description of a self-righteous moat picker. He says, how can you, how can you presume to pick out a tiny piece of dust, one piece of dust out of your neighbor's eye when you've got a big log sitting in your own eye? He says, you can't do it because you need to clear your own log out first. Clean your own business out first. Deal with your own sin and righteousness first. And then once you're all good, once you're all good, and only then can you see to pick out the tiny speck, the tiny moat of dust that is in your neighbor's eye. So you can't pick out the moat until you've cleared the log out of your own eye. But once you clear the log out of your own eye, then you're free to pick out the moat in your neighbor's. Well, here's the twist. Jesus never picked out moats in people's eyes. Jesus was not a moat picker. I don't see it anywhere in the Gospels. It's never written down where Jesus looked and inspected people's lives to point out all their flaws. In fact, he didn't like it. And he was the only one that was righteous enough to do it. 
Here's Jesus, the only righteous person to walk the earth that was qualified to pick out the flaws in other people's lives. He had no log in his eye. He didn't even have a speck, not even a moat in his eye. His eyes were perfectly clean, and they could see clearly. He was the only one that was qualified ever to pick out the moats and the flaws and the sins in somebody else's life. And he never did it. Never happened. That wasn't the way he operated, even though he was the only one that could operate that way. Actually, when he was confronted with people's sin, when he was confronted with the moats or their logs in their eye, instead of picking it out, he actually showed great compassion and understanding and forgiveness. I say that, but there was one exception. There was one exception when Jesus was very, very critical and consistently critical of other people and their sins. And that was if you were a moat picker. That seemed to be the one thing that Jesus had to speak out over and over and over again about. If you're the type of person that liked to pick out the sins and the flaws in other people's life, Jesus would point your sin out to you. The only righteous man ever to walk the earth, and he chose not to point out other people's sins. I think there is a profound lesson for us if we read this right. And that lesson is righteous people don't pick out other people's sins. I want to say this again because I want you to remember, if you remember nothing else I say today, Remember this, righteous people don't pick out other people's sins. All right, one more time for good measure. Righteous people don't pick out other people's sins. See, we're not qualified to do it in the first place until we're righteous, but as soon as we're righteous, we lose all interest in it. We lose all interest in picking out the other people's sins the moment we become righteous. So if you want to be righteous, don't be a moat picker or a doconite or a speckler, however, however you want to say it. But it's not just bad for our righteousness. Moat picking can be dangerous. Not just for us and our relationships. Moat picking can be dangerous for the world. You know what caused the Spanish Inquisition? The torture and execution of heretics, people who thought different from us? It was moat picking. That's what started it all. You're doing something wrong and I'm going to fix it. You know why we burned heretics at the stake? We were being moat pickers picking out the sins in other people's eyes and destroying them for it. That's why we had witch hunts. We were being moat pickers. That's what caused the great terror during the French Revolution. They were being moat pickers. You're not Republican enough. You're not supporting the revolution enough. I'm picking out the tiny flaws in your eye, and if I find them, off with your head. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous, and and we as a culture are treading on the edge of it today. And it starts out banning people from speaking, shouting them down, calling them names, trying to erase or eradicate their voice in the public forum. And the next thing you know, you're calling for the guillotine again. You may think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. Because once you believe you are in a morally superior position, you can justify anything. As soon as you believe you have the moral clout to do it, you can justify anything. And if you don't believe me, you can ask the Ukraine. Because Vladimir Putin believes that he is right. Vladimir Putin believes he has all the moral force and fiber and righteousness behind him. Ukraine, in his eyes, belongs to Russia. And if you disagree with them, he'll kill you. And he'll keep killing you and keep killing your people until you believe exactly how he does. That's how right he believes that he is. Human life 
natural sovereignty. That means nothing next to his sense of self-righteousness. And he's a big moat picker. He sees moats picked everywhere. The West is hemming me in. NATO's trying to destroy me. Poor little Vladimir Putin. And he's picking all the moats out of the eyes of the world. And man, he's got some logs in his own. And he can't see a single one of them. But it can happen to anybody. It can happen to any of us. And it begins with the little motes of dust in other people's eyes. It begins when we believe that we know exactly what is wrong in the world and it is up to me to set it all right. And if we ride that out long enough, eventually it becomes it's up to me to set it all right and I can do it at whatever cost. Because what I'm doing is that right. See, but as soon as your righteousness leads you to point out the sins of others, it's no longer righteous. Because the righteous don't concern themselves with the sins of others. The righteous and those who strive for righteousness know that their sin is more than enough to keep them busy. So I don't know if any of these words are helpful to you. Dokenite, speckler, moat picker. Take whatever one you want. You don't even have to credit me for it. You can use it. Free use. But whatever you do, just remember this is not what the righteous do. We know better than to do this. Jesus was the only one worthy to pick out moats in people's eyes, and he didn't do it. And Friends, I love you. I really do. I love you. But we're not Jesus' level yet. We're not there yet. But Jesus said the disciple is never above the master. But the disciple can be like the master if he decides to learn from him. We're never going to be better than Jesus. We'll never be higher than Christ. But if we learn from him, then we can become like him. And what we learn from him today is your righteousness and your sin is your problem. Your neighbor's righteousness and sin is your neighbor's problem. Your friend's righteousness and sin is your friend's problem. You stick to your own righteousness and sin. Your life will be better for it. Your relationships will be better for it. People will like you better for it. You can avoid becoming an international dictator. That's always a plus. But most of all, most of all, you'll be a little bit more like Jesus. And at the end of the day, that is what we desire. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.